Well, I can remember using a PC 35 years ago, and I felt very proud to be one of the first users of a PC. Uh, is it safe today? Have we cracked security? So why have we not cracked security after 35 years for what was once an unconnected machine? Is it because we're stupid? Is it because we haven't bothered? Is it because there's no investment going into it? Well, of course, you know none of that is true. The inventors of PCs and operating systems and the software have invested billions of protecting what is a relatively simple device by today's standards. So here we are some 35 years on, and we are talking about all things sensing, all things connected, all things intelligent. We are talking of robotics, we are talking of artificial intelligence. So would anyone like to hazard a guess when we will be able to say, we have cracked security on this digitized world? Anyone want to run a betting book on the century that we might get to that? But that's the challenge that we have. The technology and the innovation is cumulative. We are building idea and innovation and inventiveness on top of previous technology. And that will never stop. If you go back to the old mechanical area, the steam engines, if you go back to the combustion engine, to some level of automation, to analog, Gordon Bennett, I'm showing my age now with an analog slide, to digitization, to would you say we're in the data area now? Or what's going to be after data sensing, artificial intelligence? Uh, in a moment of boredom this morning, I had the TV on and I was watching either CNN or BBC talking about retail artificial intelligence, where they were scanning the body language of people going into stores to predict whether you are going to be a shoplifter. Now, I was thinking, I wonder what the GDPR implications are about that. But there are new ways that people are thinking that we can't anticipate every potential risk that people are coming up with. And we've heard every speaker talk about international laws, international standards, international certifications. Because unless we get that base in, then we will not keep track and keep up to date with what's going on. You know new technologies, new opportunities, new threats. I won't teach Granny to suck eggs in terms of this. But I saw a statistic that says that one of the conferences, I think it was the CES in Las Vegas, the vast majority of uh, companies there, startups, were coming from a small number of cities. Some cities are inventing hundreds of thousands of startups a year. Now, in those startups, there are well-meaning, passionate, intelligent people who are trying to change the world, the next platform. And, of course, the legislators, and we've heard from our friends in the, the, the commission, the legislators have to get ahead of the curve. And it's almost impossible for them to do that because they don't see what the, invent, the innovation or the invention is coming in five or ten years' time. But let's look at this in terms of what does it mean to everybody? Because we're at, we're at the end of the food chain as a vendor when it comes to security. We absolutely expect governments and enterprises expect governments locally and internationally to set the laws and standards. No law, no standard, don't complain. And this is what some organizations are saying when it concerns how much tax does the organization pay. We comply with the laws, we pay the right amount of tax. If you want to change the laws, change the laws, but don't criticize us otherwise. So governments have this complex policy and framework role to make sure that they are setting the legal framework. But how can they set the legal framework if you can't predict the future? I used to work in government for just under eight years. And our objective was not to be prescriptive on the legal framework because we knew, give it a year or two years, it's out of date. And therefore, if it's not prescriptive, it becomes generic. Well, if it's generic, what does it actually mean? And this is the trade-off you're always trying to battle with when you're in government on how to set a law, how to set a policy. 
uh, and I was listening to my friend here, and we've discussed this before over dinner in terms of GDPR. GDPR gets criticism, well, it's interpretive. Well, GDPR is interpretive because you can't second guess everybody's business model. You can't second guess every business process. You can't second guess every purpose of processing. And it has done a pretty good job when people stop complaining about it in terms of setting a very sophisticated framework on how you can manage personal data. Enterprises rely on what governments tell them. Please, Mr. Government, tell me the law. Tell me the certification. Tell me the standard. If you just say use appropriate measures, maybe I'll think about my shareholders and profitability. If you say, as a minimum, you must do this hygiene or you must conform to this ISO standard or you must have this certification scheme, it is more specific. It's setting the baseline. And that's a very, very valuable thing to do. But in the absence of any guidance, then it is absolutely right for enterprises to make their decisions based on their business strategy, based on their business objectives, and based on the wishes of their customers and their shareholders. But poor old vendors like Huawei stuck at the end of the chain. What do we do? We don't get help from governments because they don't tell us the laws of the certifications. We get a thousand and one good ideas from our customers because you know they are using a different set of metrics to come up with their evaluation. And therefore, we have to look at this on a global scale. What is it about uh, you know, many thousands of customers around the world? What is their local laws? What is their local standards? The reality is our equipment has to be legally compliant in every country in which we operate. And that implies that we know the law in every country in which we operate. Because if we don't know that, how can we say it's legally compliant? We do not make the assumption, and Ken talked about this in terms of ABC, assume nothing, believe no one, check everything, that all of our customers understand their local laws. I can guarantee put 10 lawyers in a room and ask them one question, you'll get 12 answers coming out of it. It is not because they are bad people, it's because often the law is interpretive. There is no case studies in terms of these things. But we as vendors have to interpret this to build in our products. So, nice words. This is our commitment from our big boss in terms of security and privacy. Commercial interests will never outweigh the protection of our products and our data. We protect data, we don't monetize it. But actually, just look at the picture in the background. Those of you who are a chess player will spot there's something a little bit wrong with the image. There's a one or two many pawns in there. And this is indicative of different rules being applied around the world and the challenges that we face. So let me tell you about our approach. So I've told you the challenges governments have, enterprises have, vendors have, and we're not alone in this. All vendors have the same challenge. But we have to make our own decisions. This is our framework. Uh, we call it 2.0. We've been working on it for a couple of years now. Uh, like all organizations, we have our internal battles and debates and challenges. But this is broadly it. You've got to be compliant. You can't break the law in any country in which you operate. But it's not just external compliance. It's internal com compliance. You have to make sure that your people, your employees, do not break the rules and regulations. And just because you move someone from Brazil to Germany, the laws are different there. You have to make sure you train these people. You need to make sure that you acclimatize them to a different legal regime. You have to have the right people doing the right thing. Now, Huawei is blessed with over 80,000 people in R&D. We have over 3,000 people with PhDs. We are not short of the brightest people on the planet. But getting them focused in the right direction, all doing the same thing, is a challenge for any large organization. And that's what we must do with our talent, our values, our culture, our business processes, our automation. You can't rely in an organization of 180,000 people with plenty of outsource for things just to happen by osmosis. If you have random processes, random policies, you will get random quality and random service. And this is not the reputation that we have with our customers. The technology in the middle is changing all the time. Come back in a year, there might be a new buzzword on there. Come back in five years, there'll definitely be new buzzwords there. So this is not about being technology-centric. This is about, in some aspects, being agnostic to technology. 
because good quality, good products and good service are pervasive across every kind of technology. On the left-hand side, customer requirements and insight is hugely important. Different people have different appetites to risk. There are some people who say to us, John, my network is stable. I know it's got some vulnerabilities. I just don't want to update it. I can manage the risk in a different way. Other people say, any vulnerability, patch immediately. And they are prepared to take any level of risk in terms of stability. We've talked about resilience at the end of the day in an all-connecting, all-sensing world. And we've talked about this before from our previous speaker. You've got to make sure whatever you have is up and running. It's not about it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's about it's up, and if there is a problem and you work on the assumption someone will break in and be successful, you've got to degrade slowly. Because in an all-connected world, suddenly everything becomes uh, critical. Not critical in the international sense of a critical infrastructure like power, but if I'm running my business in a digitized kind of way, and all of my e-commerce sites go down globally, that is pretty critical to me. Time is money. So it's not about crash, it's about degrade. And on the right-hand side, about customer value. This is key. At the end of the day, customers measure us by, in, in essence, on what they've asked us to do in the bidding documents, what we said we would do in the contracts, because those contracts that we have will be reflective of the rules and regulations that they believe they are under in terms of their governments and their industries. So that's our framework. Uh, it is top down, it is bottom up. It is not about money. We've already announced that we're gonna put $2 billion into enhancing some of our R&G. We've built up a little bit of clutter over the last 30 years, and it's time to re-engineer where we've learned new things, uh, get rid of some stuff that's no longer valid, think differently about resilience, uh, and that's the model that we're doing in terms of the right-hand side. But I said earlier, where well, you're looking at artificial intelligence and big data and all sensing and all connecting, Huawei cannot do that on its own. And we are very passionate about the collaborations that we form with industry. We are a member of a vast number of standards bodies. You know, we fundamentally believe, in essence, that the more heads you can get together, the better you're going to come out in a product and solution. Complex slide, you don't really need to understand all the detail. I'm going to quickly show you six things. The first thing, as I said, you've got to know the products and services. You need to know the standards, the certification schemes, the laws and regulations and requirements on the left. If you don't know that on the left, it is almost impossible for you to design and build products based on a standard or privacy by design or anything else. So you need your requirements, which includes laws. And when you've done that, you've got a pretty good chance of building the right product. But just because you've built it, you need to set it legally. Not all components can be sold in all countries. Different countries have different rules, certainly to do with things like lawful or legal intercept, for example. But even if you can sell it, you then need to manufacture it. How do you make sure you manufacture things as best as you can with untampered with components? How do you make sure nobody in manufacturing knows where the equipment is going, being destined? How do you make sure that there's zero touch between software coming off R&D to going on the actual physical equipment? Then you've got to ins install it and service it. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes our customers do that. But how do we make sure that our, our employees are not the threat? How do we track and trace everything we do? How do we make sure what's on their laptop is only legal software? All these things need to be considered in an end-to-end -end set of processes. And last but not least, Ken talked about this, ABC. We don't believe a word anything anyone says to us. We make no assumptions, we believe no one, and we have multiple lines of auditing, internal and external, to check what we're going on. And security for us and privacy covers every part of Huawei, to the way we employ people, to the way that we scrap servers, to the way we move data around the world. Uh, we talked earlier about certification schemes. Well, I can tell you there are hundreds, if not thousands, of technical standards around the world. There are also thousands of so-called best practice. You have to make your decision on which one you think is best practice. One person's best practice often is not accepted in another country's best practice. So where there is a technical standard, where there is a best practice, we look to get external 
certification for that. It doesn't matter whether it's counter-terrorism on supply chain, it doesn't matter whether it's TL9000 for quality or the ISO standards for quality and management, it doesn't matter whether in essence we are looking at new standards. So Andy Purdy, our CSO from America, spent a lot of time with organizations creating the OTP TTPS standard, which is the standard in terms of supply chain security. And our view is quite simply this, tell us a certification, tell us a standard, and we will achieve it. And we're quite happy to get external certification and verification on that. And that brings us onto this center here and why we're here today. Uh, we have a sort of what we call a closed loop management approach. This thing in the middle, this IPD thing, is the way that we design and build products, integrated product development. It's a stage process, lots of companies have them, nothing special or magical. But what we do is we have multiple layers of testing and we call this the many eyes and many hands. We think it's very, very positive to have many people looking and many people touching the products because your view of risk is different to our view of risk. And as you can see underneath, we have internal labs, we have transparency centers, this one and others around the world. We have customers using third-party testing. We have certification schemes. And our view is, if you want to test it, great. We love it. If you want to do black box, great. If you want to bring your own people or third-party experts, brilliant. If you want to come to our center or do it on your site, fabulous. So the answer for us is yes. We will come up with a way that satisfies most people. And we think, in essence, that's the best way that you can grow security. Because as we've said earlier, there is no magic bullet. So let me summarize that. <clears throat> Governments and regulators face the same problem. How can they balance uh, analog and digital worlds across virtual borders? And you're not just seeing this playing out in the cybersecurity space. You're seeing this being played out in the privacy space. You're seeing this being played out in the taxation space. In the good old days of my country is an island, I'm from the UK and we are an island, you know, we can't protect that border anymore. It's gone global. So what are the legal frameworks? What are the standards? What are the certifications? And we fully applaud the role that Europe is doing in this. And we do believe passionately that GDPR is a good model for doing it. If you can do something on privacy, we believe you can do something on security and we will work tirelessly with our European colleagues to try and make that happen. Industries themselves are entering digitization, and all industries face the same problem. And their first problem is, will they be around in 10 years? That early chart I showed you, not many of those companies exist. I did read somewhere only one company on the original DAO still exists on the DAO today. But how can they adapt and flourish when somebody in some distant island sitting on a beach is inventing a new business on a global supply chain? And the rules and regulations on what they have to do is different to maybe the rules in, in somewhere else in Asia or in Europe. They need to know what is the minimum standard. They need to know what's important for their government and the countries in which we're operating. There is an on cost if digital platforms and companies spanning the world have to conform to 170 different standards or different laws. And therefore, there is a, the ability to generate GDP growth by simplification. It's simple economics. And vendors, we face the same problem. How can we provide products and services that every one of us can say, they've gone through all the right privacy by design, security by design, they've gone through the testing, the verification, it's been open and transparent, achieved, it's achieved all the certifications. How can we do that in a consistent way? And we need the help of regulators, and we need the help of our enterprise customers. Until we get to that point, all ideas are good ideas. And therefore, also, all ideas are bad ideas. You know, it's quite hard to get even industry bodies, no offense to our industry bodies, in the room all agreeing, because they bring different things and different perspectives from their countries. So we believe the solution lies with governments and industry working together, collaborating in a transparent way to define what we believe are the laws, define what we believe are the standards, define what we believe are the certification. And we do not start with an empty box. There's plenty there. But if we can adopt a GDPR-like 
do it in Europe, we believe the world will be a better place. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm glad my voice has held out, and uh, I'll uh, see you all again later. Thank you.